Welcome to Lecture 3 in History 361, African American History to 1877 at New Mexico State University. I am Professor Bronstein, and today I'm going to be talking about slavery and freedom in early English North America. I'm going to be talking today about the South, um, and then Lecture 4 is going to be about slavery in the north and on the frontier. So, all right, so the English get involved with colonization through competition with the Spanish. For example, Sir Francis Drake circumnavigated the globe in order to uh, show that. The English were just as capable as the Spanish were of colonization, and in his circumnavigation of the globe, which occurred during Queen Elizabeth's reign, he um, and his men committed piracy on various different Spanish uh, settlements throughout South America. Um, Drake, one of the things that he thought is that English settlement in the New World would save um, black people and Indian people from Spanish tyranny, or at least he said so. So in addition to spending most of his career raiding for Spanish gold, he allied with a band of escaped slaves to attack the Spanish at Panama in 1572 and liberated slaves in Spanish St. Augustine, Florida in 1586. Then um, after Drake passed from the scene, uh, the English were able to establish their first permanent colony in Jamestown in 1607. It was founded by the Virginia Company, a joint stock company chartered by James I. And as you probably know, if you've taken any, you know, introduction to American history, Jamestown was a colony that really held on by the skin of its uh, fingernails. Um, there was a time when it was down to only 60 residents as the people there were starving and um, didn't really come prepared to do any farming themselves, really thought that they were going to be trading for most of their food with the Powhatan Indians. They were mostly, uh, the first colonists in Virginia were mostly gentlemen and soldiers who, as I said, depended on the Powhatan Indians in order to survive. But this alliance, despite the fact that, you know, Pocahontas was the go-between between the Powhatans and the settlers, uh, this alliance was not always peaceful. And the colony was only saved from collapse by the discovery that a hybrid, a smokable hybrid of tobacco could easily be cultivated there. In 1617, Captain Samuel Argyle arrived to assume the governorship of Virginia, and he found, quote, the marketplace and streets and all other spare places planted with tobacco. The boom in tobacco cultivation resulted in an increased demand for workers. The Spanish had forced uh, Native Americans in Central and South America to work for them, but the strategy would not work for colonists in Virginia because the Eastland, Eastern Woodland Indians under the supervision of the uh, Powhatan Confederacy were not easily dominated and were just not going to do that work. Okay, so here you see British claims in uh, 1740 and the variable um, proportion of the population that is black and white in each place, and also the names of the Native American tribes. All right, so the first thing that the Virginians attempted in trying to grow tobacco in Virginia was to import indentured servants. Many indentured servants were English and Scots-Irish landless rural laborers and urban paupers. You see, um, there were tough times in Great Britain at this point, and if people didn't have a visible means of support, 
they could be offered the choice of signing an indenture and being sent to Virginia or being jailed. So many people did sign on to be indentured servants. They were required to work for four to seven years to pay the cost of their transportation and maintenance. Um, after which, if they managed to survive four to seven years of backbreaking labor in the hot sun with mosquitoes everywhere, then they would be freed, given freedom dues and a suit of clothing and could go off and become wage laborers and then ultimately purchase land. The first Africans arrived in the Chesapeake uh, in 1619. They were purchased from a passing Dutch ship. And the first servants in 1619 were followed by other groups a few dozen at a time. By all the evidence that historians have, the first African servants were also indentured servants, which is to say they didn't have a hereditary servitude. They uh, were freed after a certain number of years. They worked along white ser alongside white servants. They ran away together. They cohabitated with white servants and they even intermarried. Early colonial documents listed both groups, black and white, as servants. And so the um, Africans were afforded more of an opportunity to move from servitude to freedom at this time than their descendants would be in later generations. However, within a couple of generations, local courts and legislatures began to codify a status for African servants that was different from that of white servants. So we can say, oh, the first 20 years or so, um, they were on similar footing although we don't know how they were actually treated. Um, but starting in 1640, you begin to see this legal transformation. By 1640, Virginia courts acknowledged that planters were not legally obligated to release Africans from servitude because they hadn't signed indentures. John Punch, a black servant who ran away with two white servants, was sentenced to, quote, serve his said master in his assigns for the time of his natural life here or elsewhere, while his white comrades were only sentenced to an additional year of service. Other laws show that uh, black people had begun to acquire an inferior status in the colonies. A 1643 law charged African women a labor tax. A 1662 law made black women's status inheritable, decreeing that, quote, all children born in this country shall be held bond or free only according to the condition of the mother. And so the point of making um, the mother's condition uh, determine the child's condition was that planters could have children with their um with their black servants and then those children would be enslaved. And that was not a thing that the Virginia legislature wanted to, um, wanted to discourage. They were fine with that. Uh, <clears throat> normally under English law, paternity was used to establish inheritance. So this maternity based status determination was new and different. And normally under English law, women's labor was considered domestic labor and not taxable labor. So again, these are big changes from the existing state of the law that are happening in Virginia in order to codify slavery as a labor system. The slavery system that developed in the colonies treated Africans as movable personal property. So within this system, they didn't have rights or legal authority, not even over their own children. Laws passed by Virginia legislators that determine an individual status followed his or her mother's status clarified questions that were raised um, in freedom suits like that of Elizabeth Key. In 1656, Elizabeth Key petitioned for her freedom. Her mother was a slave and her father was English. She pursued her freedom in court, 
and got several different verdicts. The only thing that probably saved her from a slavery uh, status in the long run was that she married her lawyer and the lawyer won the case. So at that point, it was really hard for the General Assembly to say, no, Elizabeth Key, we're not going to give you your freedom. In 1691, Virginia lawmakers really outlawed interracial marriages. The new law explained that any white person who married, quote, a Negro, mulatto, or Indian would be forever banished from the colony, quote, within three months of such marriage. But white men were neither barred nor discouraged from having sexual relationships with enslaved women. Initially, there was some question in North America about whether or not it was ethical or legal to enslave Christians. And this worry was preventing slaveholders from having their enslaved people baptized. To deal with these scruples, Virginia lawmakers passed an act that said, you don't get all the benefits that you normally would get as a Christian if you are black. Baptism, for example, did not alter the condition of the person as to his bondage or freedom. So uh, Americans were even sort of changing the rules on the ground when it came to how Christianity was considered when it came to enslaved people. Now you were allowed to enslave Christians as long as they were black. The black population soared in the Upper South, increasing from a few hundred people in 1650 to 4,000 in 1680. In 1660, the English had entered the slave trade, establishing the Royal African Company, and they began to specifically ship enslaved people to their colonies in the New World, thus supplying colonists with a steady stream of affordable African captives. Chattel slavery also had unique benefits from the perspective of the planters. That is, first of all, uh, the labor force would reproduce itself. Um, they really didn't want to, as in the Caribbean, have people die during seasoning time and then just replace them. The idea was that the labor force would grow through the formation of families. Another benefit from the planter's perspective is that a dark-skinned person on the loose was easy to identify as a runaway. And we can see all kinds of runaway slave advertisements from this time period. For example, in 1739, the Virginia Gazette reported that a, quote, new Negro who could not, quote, speak English his name is understood to be Tom, was detained by local authorities who, quote, supposed him to be a runaway. Another advantage um, was that it was easy to um, grow uh, somebody's supply of enslaved people on their own plantation um, just by having planters uh, sexually abuse the women on their plantations since all the children that would be born to enslave women followed the condition of the mother. Planters in the Chesapeake also assumed that African people were easier to control than white servants would be. And there was stuff going on in Virginia that um, made planters distrust landless whites. For example, Landless whites challenged colonial authorities, antagonized local Indian populations, and formed alliances with enslaved Africans to undermine the planter class. A good example of this is in 1676. Bacon's rebellion broke out when Nathaniel Bacon really wanted the governor of Virginia to okay an attack on Indians in the western portion of the Virginia colony at that point. Um, a lot of the frontier dwellers had bad relationships with Native Americans, and when the governor would not agree to allow Bacon to lead a regiment against the Indians, Bacon and these other Western farmers marched on Williamsburg, the capital, and clashed with Governor William Barclay, 
And the rebellion underscored the dangers of importing thousands of white male servants into a colony that really didn't give them that many opportunities and led planters to gravitate even more toward the enslavement of black people as a labor force. There was an extraordinary demographic shift in the Chesapeake region during the 18th century. In Virginia, African Americans constituted 7% of Virginia's population in 1680. By 1750, the population was 44% black. In Maryland, the population of uh, black people increased from 9% to 30%. These Africans brought to the Chesapeake after, 70, or after 1680 didn't have the same opportunities afforded to African Americans who came earlier. These, quote, new Negroes came from Africa's interior. They worked on plantations in the remote upcountry. They cleared land and cultivated tobacco and other crops under the supervision of white overseers. Still traumatized by the Middle Passage, one quarter died within a year of arrival. Two-thirds of the new arrivals were men who planters assigned to quarters where they didn't have any chance to form family ties. Their unfamiliarity with English also inhibited their communication with acculturated slaves. But somehow... New Negroes managed to survive. They developed their own common language, and this Creole language seems to have been a uh, combination of English and several different African languages. Groups of African-born slaves sometimes conspired and revolted together. In 1710 and 1722, Colonists interrupted insurrection plots and executed the conspirators. One day in 1730, when most plantation owners were in church, more than 300 enslaved rebels fled plantations and set up camp in the dismal swamp on Virginia's southeast border. A visitor to the region noted that the rebels, quote, did a great deal of mischief in that province of Virginia before the colonists recruited some Pasquotank Indians to hunt them down. The slave unrest of the 1700s resulted in greater restrictions placed on free people of color in the colony, since whites assumed that free blacks and especially mixed race people were fomenting these rebellions. In response, new Virginia laws passed in the 1720s disarmed and disenfranchised free blacks and mulattoes. All right, so just to reemphasize there, you have have the original cohorts of people coming from Africa up until about 1680. They become acculturated. Then new groups of enslaved people from the African interior are brought in, have a hard time um, acculturating to British North America. Um, there are some rebellions that lead planters to crack down on all black people, including free, free black people. And uh, in the 1720s, the few rights that free blacks and mulattoes had in Virginia were taken away. Now I'm going to talk about slavery in the Carolinas. In 1663, the colony of Carolina was established. Uh, originally, there wasn't North and South Carolina. It was just a single entity called Carolina. Half of the colonists who populated Carolina migrated from an English colony in the Caribbean called Barbados, dominated by sugar plantations cultivated by slaves. When Carolina was established, some of these English planters moved to Carolina and searched for suitable crops to grow in the region with the slaves that they brought with them. There they happened upon rice cultivation which was largely due to the expertise of the enslaved Africans who already knew how to grow and process rice. By the 1720s, Carolina was producing some 10 million pounds of rice a year. In 
Slaves who cultivated rice worked under a task system, which involved minimal white supervision. So a certain amount of work would be set out for the day as the task. And then black overseers directed other enslaved black people to complete the task. This system underscored white colonists' dependence on slaves' knowledge of African cultivation methods. In response, <clears throat> slave traders began to kind of cater to Carolina preferences by promoting shipments from the Gold Coast and Windward Coast of Africa, which had more rice cultivating slaves. From the perspective of the enslaved people, the task system allowed enslaved people time each day to work for themselves because once you finish your daily task, then you had the rest of the time to cultivate your own livestock, grow provisions. Um, but as rice became more and more profitable, planters began, began to demand more and more in terms of the daily task from the enslaved people, limiting their ability to work for themselves. Carolina planters, like planters in the Chesapeake, didn't concern themselves with converting their slaves. One Anglican missionary noted that the slaves worked seven days a week and that there were great distances between plantations and that these prohibited religious instruction and gatherings for slaves. He also believed that such gatherings would be unwise even if they were for religious instruction because, quote, the opportunity of knowing their own strength and superiority in point of number would make them tempted to recover their liberty. All right, so to put that another way, <clears throat> the Africans brought into the Carolinas really uh, were such a large proportion of the population that it was thought unsafe to make them aware of this fact. Enslaved Africans in the Carolinas until the 1760s, mostly African-born, maintained their own distinct communities. They lived on plantations that housed as many as 100 slaves. They built their own quarters using techniques from their homelands. They cooked in earthen pots. They spoke Creole languages. And their bodies displayed their, quote, country marks or facial scars and clipped teeth, which were used to identify their origins. Enslaved Africans in the Carolinas also retained African religious traditions and incorporated practices borrowed from their new environment. They often believed in magic and in conjurers or like medicine men who could heal the sick and kill their enemies. Even white people feared these conjurers. We're still not in a, a fully sort of scientific method mindset among the English at this point. They were quite scared of witches and people with powers. Enslaved Africans, like Africans in the Chesapeake, ran away and planned rebellions. In 1690, Carolina adopted the slave code from Barbados, which held that runaways could be punished by being whipped, by having their noses slit, and by being branded with a hot iron. Three-time offenders could be castrated or be hamstrung. That is a punishment that involved um, handicapping a person by cutting their leg tendons. So some truly um, gory and gross punishments possible in the Carolinas for um, enslaved people. By the time of the Stono Rebellion in 1739, black residents of South Carolina which at this point was its own separate place, outnumbered white residents two to one. On Sunday, September 9th, 1739, 20 enslaved men, led by a man called Jemmy, gathered near the Stono River in Carolina, stole guns and ammunition from a nearby store, killed the shopkeepers, and headed south armed with guns, axes, clubs, two drums, and some banners. Some of the rebels performed war dances, the enslaved men in that area were from the Kingdom of Congo, which is in modern-day Angola. The, they were uh, Catholics, having been converted by the Portuguese. And because many of them spoke Portuguese, they were able to communicate with the Spanish in nearby Florida, who as part of their global conflict with England, 
were promising enslaved Christians freedom. So they kind of wanted to go to Florida and live there. During the Stono Rebellion, these uh, enslaved Angolan people killed the white planters that they passed, burned their homes to the ground. Um, they didn't um, they didn't discriminate on the basis of gender or age, just killing everybody basically, sparing only a tavern owner known to be kind to his slaves and a plantation owner hidden by his slaves. The group was 90 strong and 10 miles from home when a patrol of white people tracked them down. More than 40 slaves were killed before the rebellion was suppressed and the other rebels were executed without trial. It's likely that the Stono Rebellion was inspired by several factors. First of all, a malaria epidemic had ravaged Charleston, and so um, that weakened uh, the white people, and also political tensions between Britain and Spain were at their height. The rebels were hoping to march to the settlement of Fort Mose, which was on the outskirts of St. Uh, Augustine in what is today Florida, and as I said, they were hoping to take up residence with the Spanish. South Carolina remained committed to slavery after the rebellion and responded to the event by adopting the 1740 Negro Act, which granted white people permission to kill rebellious black people without a trial, lawfully, quote unquote, and with no consequences. So we can see here the sort of um, ultimate logical endpoint of this uh, completely totalitarian system of slavery in South Carolina with an act that just left any black person being um, open to being killed by a white person who then could say, oh, they were, um, they were rebellious, they were combative. The last thing I'm going to talk about in this lecture is slavery in Georgia. Now, Georgia didn't have slavery at first. It was founded as a kind of social experiment by a group of British trustees who wanted to send poor white farmers um, to a new colony. They wouldn't have any political representation. They would be governed directly by a board of governors from London. And the point was to help these poor white farmers uplift themselves by working hard. So the trustees said no slavery in this colony. The existence of slavery will make white people lazy by giving them other people to do the work for them. So Georgia was founded and in fact these poor white landowners were sent to Georgia and they quickly noticed that in nearby colonies slaves were available and that other people were having a much other white people were having a much better quality of life by having slaves. And so they demanded um, at the threat of social upheaval, they demanded slavery. And uh, the British government finally backed down and allowed slavery in Georgia. So the point I'm making here is that for white people in the colonies by the 1730s, it was clear that white liberty was not possible without black slavery. That People thought of those two things as inseparable, that Americans, um, British North Americans did not think of themselves as having complete freedom and liberty unless they had other people to do their work for them. So uh, that's where we are at this point. And I will continue on in lecture four talking about slavery in New England and in the Middle Atlantic states. See you in the comments. Thank you.